Hi, my name is Alex Lobenko, and today I'll be presenting some work I've done during my postdoc on the phylogenetic and functional diversity of desert dwelling birds. So I want to start with this uh, slide showing a map that many of you have probably seen, a version of at least, of the latitudinal diversity gradient of birds. And one of the striking things that uh, is immediately seen in this map is the peak of richness of bird diversity uh, near the equator in the tropics. And this has led many researchers to wonder why are there so many birds in the tropics? However, there is a, another side to this, uh, to this coin, which is that richness doesn't just um, steadily drop from the, tro uh, the tropics towards the poles, but there is a noticeable dip around the deserts, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, but this uh, decline in bird diversity in the deserts can also be seen to a lesser degree in the Southern Hemisphere. And this leads me to ask the complementary question of why are there so few birds in the desert? And to do that, the first thing we have to do is consider what exactly is a desert. So this is the image that uh, comes to my mind when I think of a desert. These are the deserts of Israel, where I'm from. And one of the things that make a desert a desert, in fact, the thing, is that there is very low precipitation. And there's uh, really very low availability of water in general. Now, this has all sorts of effects on what life in the desert is like. For one thing, and partly because of the low cloud cover, deserts are uh, often experience really extreme temperatures. And depending on the location and the season, they can be either very hot uh, during uh, summer or during the day, or very cold during winter or during the night. And these shifts can also happen during the day in some seasons. So there are really extreme temperature regimes in the desert. Also, because of the low precipitation, uh, deserts are often have really, really low primary productivity. There are very few plants. What few plants there are usually annuals or very low-lying shrubs. They're usually concentrated in low points of the topography, such as stream beds. Um, and, uh, and there's also very uh, shallow soil and really pretty poor soil, not very rich in organic material. All of this makes the desert a pretty difficult environment to live in. And while there has been quite a lot of research on plants and various animals and how they cope physiologically with the uh, desert environments, not a lot of work has been done on birds, surprisingly. So this is where uh, I and my colleagues came in. And first of all, we uh, defined where the deserts of the world exist. We followed the methodology of Tejero Siquendes, who did a similar work uh, on lizards, where we define deserts as the ecoregions that fall within the, the arid regions biome of the world. But we focused on the contiguous areas that also included hyper-arid regions, which were areas where the aridity index is below 0.2. So these are the driest areas of the world. This means that essentially we capture the large deserts of the world and we don't really include smaller arid regions like, for instance, the arid islands of the Galapagos. We then used bioregionalization based on the uh, birds that inhabit these broad deserts to divide our general deserts of the world into seven distinct deserts that differ from one another in their faunal composition. So for instance, everything within the yellow uh, polygon um, which is the Sahara Arabian Desert, has a similar bird uh, assemblage that is distinct from the Central Asian bird assemblage, even though those deserts are really close to one another. We then defined what are desert-dwelling birds, and we did this by overlapping the ranges of the birds, of their uh, breeding, non-breeding, and resident ranges, with the desert shape files. So a bird that has less than 15% of its range in the desert, which is most birds, we call a non-desert species. A bird that has between 15 to 50% 50 of its range in the desert, we call desert occupier. So it's a species that occurs in the desert, but, can also, but most of its range is actually outside the desert. And anything that has over half of its range in the desert, we define as a desert specialist. So these are species that are mostly found just in deserts. And we compared the uh, phylogenetic distribution and the functional traits of these desert species to non-desert species. And in order to do that, we needed to uh, find a, a good method of comparison of the desert and non-desert birds. 
We did this by devising null models of desert occupancy. So we overlapped our deserts with different phyloregions of bird diversity, and we found a regional pool for each desert, which essentially is made up of all the species that occur in the phyloregions that overlap with that desert. So we have distinct regional pools of species that might occur potentially in that desert, uh, just based on uh, general spatial and uh, biogeographical proximity. We then generated null, uh, null desert assemblages by populating our uh, desert assemblages using two different random models. One of them is a random draw, so we basically just reshuffled the, uh, the, the regional pool to create random assemb desert assemblages. And the other way was using the dynamic assembly model where we uh, grow the phylogeny of the desert assemblage over time using empirically derived rates of speciation, colonization, and local extinction from the desert environment. So this gave us these different null communities to compare to when we examine the phylogenetic and functional diversity of our actual observed desert assemblages. So if we plot all our desert dwelling birds on the phylogeny, we find that uh, actually all areas of the bird tree of life have desert dwelling species, uh, which you can see based on the uh, yellow colored branches or based on specific types of their ranges and the uh, encircling rings. We found that uh, several families have a higher uh, than expected proportion of desert dwelling birds. Uh, and most of these families are actually old world families. There, there are no new world endemic families in this, uh, in this list. However, there are six different families that are endemic to Australia out of the total of 15 families that we find here, which is pretty interesting in and of itself. And we'll get back to why uh, Australia is interesting in a moment. So we compare the phylogenetic diversity of the desert dwelling birds to what is expected based on our null communities. And we find that generally in all deserts, uh, or most deserts at least, uh, desert species have a higher nearest taxon index than expected from null models, which is a measure that indicates phylogenetic clustering, which could suggest that there is some sort of habitat filtering happening in deserts because only clo uh, because species in deserts are more closely related than expected by chance. At least for most deserts, not so much for Australia, um, but Australia, as we've seen, is a bit unusual, and also having a lot of families that are, have over-representation of desert species. And in fact, we do find some phylogenetic clustering in Australia, but deeper in the, brand, in the tree, not so much at the tips. But we must also remember that Australia is unusual in that it is the youngest of the different deserts of the world, and also Australia's deserts make up most of the region, which might suggest that the dynamics of desert colonization in Australia were different than the rest of the world. We looked at the morphology of desert birds using two databases of, mor of uh, morphology. One is a body shape morphospace, space, which characterizes the general shape of the body, including things like body uh, size, wing length, hand, hand wing index, etc., and a geometric morphometrics uh, database on bill morphology, which basically characterizes the shape of the of the bill uh, uh, separated from its size. We find that in uh, desert birds tend to occupy similar areas of the morphospace, so pretty much what we would expect based on the random communities. But in most deserts, but not all of them, they tend to have higher density measured by these lower than expected values of nearest neighbor distances. So basically they occupy the same general area of morphospace, but just more tightly packed around specific areas which we can also see if we plot the morphospaces spaces in these density plots, the brighter areas are ones with higher density. And we can see that even though the overall area of the morphospace space occupied by the desert species is similar to the non-desert species, the density tends to be higher. That is, there are fewer bright patches and the bright patches are, tend to be smaller, but it's not a really strong pattern. So we thought that maybe this higher density might suggest that some areas of the morphospace space are just more occupied. So some morphologies tend to be more uh, represented in desert environments. And so we 
wanted to examine which traits, actual functional traits, of uh, desert birds are more likely to appear. And we did this by using uh, phylogenetic logistic regressions. And we find that on average, desert birds tend to be, are more likely to be ground nesters, whereas non-desert birds are more likely to be, uh, to nest in elevated nests or within cavities. We find that desert birds are more likely to be cooperative breeders compared to non-desert birds. Uh, they're more likely to be granivorous, whereas non-desert birds are more likely to be frugivorous. Uh, we find that desert birds are more likely to be ground or general foragers, whereas non-desert birds are more likely to be aerial hawkers or arboreal gleaners. Uh, desert birds are more likely to be either fully or partially migratory, whereas non-desert birds are more likely to be sedentary. And desert birds are more likely to be weakly territorial, whereas non-desert birds are more likely to be either strongly or non-territorial at all. We also compared some life history traits, and we find that desert birds tend to have larger clutches than non-desert birds. They have, tend to have a shorter incubation period and a shorter fledging period, which together means that in general they have um, about 10 days shorter on average uh, development time from egg laying to fledging, but the difference is more pronounced in the fledging period, which means that they actually have really similar and desert birds even have slightly longer relative incubation periods. So if we sum all of this up, we see that the harsh abiotic conditions in the desert create physiological and ecological constraints, which likely lead to some sort of habitat filtering, which means the desert birds tend to have faster life histories, they tend to be migratory, so they don't stay as much in the harsh areas during the toughest seasons, and they typically have lower energetic demands by uh, breeding faster, eating less energetic food, and in less energetically demanding foraging methods. Um, and finally, I'd just like to thank uh, the Royal Society for sponsoring this work and for to my uh, wonderful collaborators, Emma and Chris and Gavin. And thank you very much for listening.